Next is the technical trap given by Josh and Lee. Just a few reminders. I would love if you silenced your cell phones. Secondly, um, if you have a question, please use the audience microphone that I am holding so that YouTube can hear you. And with that, let's get started. Please welcome Josh and Lee. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the technical trap. Uh, as with every good meeting, we're going to have an agenda. So we'll go through some introductions. Uh, then we're going to go into the meat and the potatoes for this, which is we want this to be very interactive. So, you know, everyone, we're going to have a session of, of back and forth discussion. Please don't hesitate. Stand up, yell things, throw things, not at me. Um, and let's have some fun with this. Uh, we're going to go through some survey data and kind of something that inspired this discussion. And we'll talk about uh, the, the technical crap and the, the impact of it. And really the goals for today, just awareness of the, around the issue and discussion and some strategies to handle it when you find yourself stuck in it. And whiskey. If there's not whiskey here, there should be soon. Um, All right, awesome. So my name's Lee. Um, by day, I'm a principal security engineer. And what does that mean? I deal with super large, super complex, ambiguous things that other people have not solved, specifically in security, different areas. By night, I'm a conference organizer, so I am a B-side Seattle organizer. Um, I also was helping out with the Diana Initiative, and um, I have my own conference, Layer 8, which is a OSINT and social engineering conference. I have stickers, so after we talk, if you're a sticker person, please come get some. Um, we're virtual this year in October, so if anybody wants you know, to join us, please do. Awesome. And real quick, so I'm Josh. Uh, I work as a senior director of security architecture and application security for uh, one of the signing companies in the world, you may know. Uh, by night uh, or by the next four days. I run the security team here at DEF CON, uh, so I spend a lot of time over there. So if you see me over there, please don't hesitate to stop and you know, say hi. Uh, why this talk? It spawned uh, back probably in the May time period where I was actually working with one of my peers and we were discussing uh, reviews and she was uh, having a, a difficult moment where someone in another org had gone up and said, well, it's great, but your team's not technical. And this had been the fourth or fifth time they continued to hear that statement. And we started to just have the, the discussion, like, what the hell do we mean when we say technical? So I did what everyone does on the internet. I posted it on LinkedIn. And we did a survey. So we're going to go and talk through some of that. Before we get through all the survey data and that goodness, we want to know what you all think. So, a little fun time. When someone is described as technical in cybersecurity, what skill or skills does that individual have? Uh, there's a couple of rules for this time period because we only have you know 45 minutes. These are thoughts, not a debate, and keep your, ma your answer to max of five words. So, you know, it's not the, you know, the story of Crimea. Yeah, please. I think that they have knowledge within one of the eight domain spaces of the system. What's that? When you say what's technical and yeah. security, I think they have knowledge within one of the domain spaces of the CISP. C-I-S-S-P. Okay, domain knowledge, the SSP. Hands on keyboard work. <laughs> Hands on <laughs> keyboard work. <laughs> Understanding of the technical stuff. Technology stuff. Understanding of the technology stuff. The what's that? Technology stuff. Okay. They can script, they can patch systems, they can build systems, they can understand network concepts. So script, they can patch, and what was the last one? Network. 
knowledge, network knowledge. Network knowledge, okay. Curiosity and willingness to learn. So what was that? Curiosity. Curiosity and willingness to learn. Oh. Curiosity. And I can't spell. Uh, what else? So you say the word technical in cybersecurity. We've so far. Oh. Subject matter expert in a platform. Subject matter expert in a platform. Okay. Anything else? Any other skill sets? Y'all are, yeah. I'm trying to think how to phrase this in five words. Um, the ability to quickly learn to an inter, at least an intermediate level, some single task. Quick learn new skills, skill adoption. The ability to produce the right answer. <laughs> the ability to be right. Okay. I guess like in the weeds, practical experience. So in the weeds, practical experience. Okay. I'd say a troubleshooter. A troubleshooter. Read and understand code. Read and understand code. Like Enigma? Okay, so like a packet level understanding? Yeah. Yeah. Did you? Anything else? You're, you're, you're technical in cybersecurity. What skill do you have? Being able to, being able to explain the, uh, the mechanism through which a security control functions. Being able to explain involved con complex. Being able to explain how a security control functions and operates. I think it's the fans. Let me come this way. Sorry. <laughs> what was it? Being able to explain how a security control operates. Uh, security controls. Aha. Being able to explain how a security okay, control okay. operates. Being able to talk to engineers. Did you get it? All right, and I heard um, talk to engineers. Can conduct a vulnerability assessment and or a pen test and understand the results. Can conduct a vulnerability assessment, can conduct, I'm gonna separate those, uh, but conducts the MSS, conducts pen test. All right, so this is a really, uh, really good uh, selection from, our, from everyone here. I wanna ask though, are there any up here that you look at and uh, you would put over in the, and I like to call it the VI or nano level fight, like, you, you disagree? What? I would say read and understand code would be that kind of a fight because you can be very technical at like packet level understanding, you can be very good at that, but not know how to write code, or vice versa. So are you saying that um, either of those skills are not necessarily required? But they would both be considered technical, in okay. my opinion. Okay. 
Is there anything else up here that would, you know, you look at and you're like, well, that's not a technical skill. Uh, not to muddy it more, but like maybe like the ability to use like Nidra or either Pro to do some reversing. Yeah, so. What about like reversing your mouse? The ability to use either Pro or Nidra to do okay. reversing. Yeah. Reversing tools? So, thanks for being part of this exercise and actually participating. Because this is the type of discussion that you know, we've been having and leading with our teams as well around, you know, what does it mean when somebody comes to you and says, you're not technical enough? You know, are, have, are, have you advanced your technical? All of these skills, like you, you look across, and I loved, um, I believe you mentioned the domains. So, um, sorry, who mentioned, sorry, you mentioned the domains. All these go across to the multiple CISSP domains, as well as skills outside of CISSP. Um, so, when we think about this from, you know, the, the next question that we asked, and we asked this question at the start of what does it mean to be technical in cybersecurity? The next question we asked was, sorry, um, of these, which of these are engineering skills? Which of these are not engineering skills? Let's we'll start with that. We'll go to the negative. Security controls and operations. Security controls and operations. I used to call that. Okay. Because my, my sysengine team does not want to do controls. Pen tests for an engineering team, conducting them, okay. I don't know. It, yeah. It's, does anyone have an engineering team that conducts pen tests? Yeah. This is why this topic is so much fun, because we have what, you know, 30 people in this room? And we have 30 different perspectives on a definition of a term that we're holding people accountable to. Oh. Well, what do you mean by If I'm in a large corporation, I'm going to be that. That's a very good point. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, the question was, what do we mean when we say engineering team? Because there there's physical engineering, there is our software engineer, there's all the domains of engineering. Um, so, oh, let me get back into the slide there. So I want to turn it back over to Lee to talk about the, the data that we pulled out. Um, I have to see it. All right, cool. So we actually did a survey. Um, and one of the questions we actually asked was, Tell us what you think, you know, technical means. Tell us what you think engineer means. And then just tell us anything else you think we should be aware of. Like, just give us your open feedback. Um, which is in a different order. So let's, I'll get there eventually. I'll, I'll go in different order. So here's the open feedback we got. Um, I'm not going to read all of them, but we highlighted the parts that we thought were relevant. Right? So greater than zero knowledge writing about code. Limited to no coding experience. Soft slash people skills. Personally, I prefer leadership skills, but you know, that's me. Uh, gatekeeping, gatekeeping. All right, so let's go back a little bit. So it was an open survey. Anybody on the internet can answer it. It's probably people we know. Let's, I mean, there's you know, a little bit of that going on. Um, so we did ask people for demographic information. I always think that's helpful, you know, just to set the tone, like who's answering these questions. We mostly got a bunch of men answering these questions. Like we were joking, like, what does that say about our, the, all the people we know? Um, and we actually got a ton of people with a lot of experience. Which I actually, I read all the data line by painstaking line. And you could really see some interesting changes that we're not gonna go into for this talk, but as you went through years of experience, 
that I thought was really, really fascinating. So everybody just gave us open-end uh, comments, like way more than five words, in case you're wondering. And so I tried to group things because I wanted to create like this word cloud. So for example, if somebody said, you need to be a pen tester, you need to know cloud security, you need to be an infrastructure person. Um, anything in like the, the SIFs domains, I put together all as security domain. Um, just because that was easier, because I mean otherwise you just get like the world's largest word cloud that would mean nothing to anyone. Um, so you saw a lot of people said security domain. A lot of people actually said systems. So you, you both the systems concept and systems design, I broke them apart, please don't hate me. Um, some people didn't actually go into security domains, you would just say security all up, and I didn't really know what to do with that, so I left it alone. Um, I mean, coding's up there. Like, it's pretty big, right? And somewhere there's scripting, not as big, much smaller. But what I thought was really interesting were the number of people who, who said you have to understand. You have to have knowledge. Um, sometimes people might use the word expertise even, right? So it's like, you have to understand. Oh, okay, cool. So what did they say for engineer then? I mean, it's similar, but it's different, right? Like, coding is probably the biggest word out there, which I thought was fascinating. And then build, which makes sense, right? Like, we all build something. Um, Again, you got security domain, you got systems. I think someone said hands-on at one point, that got up there. I saw a lot of people call out tools and tooling um, and controls, and so like all the words we use, right? So we already hit the comments of no, but I wanna bring it back up again, right? So I think the bottom two are the most telling for me, right? Like I love the not technical is almost always a gatekeeping way of saying not technical in the same way. I think that was brilliant. It's such an easy way to capture kind of what we're discussing. Okay, so we've talked about a bunch of words. You all participated, you're all awesome. Um, so what's the solution to the confusion? Well, I mean, we're nerds, so we like went to the dictionary. And we're like, what does the dictionary say about the word technical? What does the dictionary say about the word engineer? Um, so does anybody in here like maintain public works, like build bridges or anybody, anybody maintain engines? Anybody like an electronic engineer? No? I was kind of hoping there'd be one. Structural engineer? No. Um, Wait, there are no engineers in this room? <laughs> so, I thought this was really interesting. I also love the fact that engineer is both a noun and a verb. That kind of cracked me up when I was doing the work. I was like, oh, I can, I can, I mean, it makes sense, right? We talk about engineering a solution. We also talk about humans as engineers. So that's what the Oxford Language Dictionary says. Um, so why do we not know what to call things? And why do we have this problem? I'll be really honest. I do think a lot of it is unconscious bias. Right, like we don't mean to stereotype, but we do. And we've all taken, like, well maybe I shouldn't assume things. A lot of us have taken some sort of bias training at work, right? We all talk about it. So I do think that is definitely a problem. There's the affinity bias. Like we like people like ourselves. I mean, it's really funny. If you ever go through your network to spend some time, like my network is obviously more heavily weighted towards women even though I'm obviously in an industry that is more heavily weighted towards men. But that's an affinity bias. Um, you got confirmation bias. Hey, I do pen testing, so I like the person who does pen testing, because they're cool. I actually don't do pen testing, but that was an example. Um, there's also time pressure, right? Like, you've got to make decisions quick. So when you think about your interview experience, right, you're trying to make a judgment. You've got 60 minutes to figure out is this person the right human for the right job. There's a time pressure there. And I also think this one's key. We've got a lot of really hard problems to solve that we don't know how to solve. There's just too much ambiguity. And so we say, oh, we just need someone technical to solve our problems. 
So how does that impact our industry? Well, I think this data is out of date, right? We have, but they estimate we'll have 3.5 million openings in cybersecurity. Now, I know there's a big debate whether this is accurate data or not, but look, even tech recruiters say there's bias. Like, let's be real, like this is a real problem for us. And we know that there's bias in performance reviews and promotions, and unfortunately, they impact women and underrepresented minorities much greater than folks in the majority. And if we want to be an inclusive industry, we've got to tackle this. So I'm going to turn it back to Josh for how we're going to tackle this. Tackle? I used to play football. I know this. Oh, wait. So this technical trap is a huge impact. And anyone can be trapped in this. You think about throughout your career, if you've ever had a review where they, the review feedback was, you know, I really want you to be more technical. You know, I really want you to uh, uh, code more when you're working as a network engineer. Um, these things act as gates. These keep individuals from, you know, progressing in their career. And if you're that individual getting told that over and over, you're not technical, you're not technical, you're not technical, what are you going to start to believe? So I tried to generalize the addressing this for something for both ICs and folks who have management. So uh, I run a team of about 25, and the first thing that I, I tell folks to do is it's all about sitting with the uncomfortable and getting ready to be uncomfortable. Because there are times that you are the person being held back by this trap, and there are times that you're the person implementing this trap. We all can have biases. So acknowledge that there is bias in our language, there is a lack of clarity in a lot of our language and how we apply it, and how we measure others against it, and take that time to intentionally ponder what that means. So when I say intentionally ponder, it's really taking a moment to, to sit quietly and think about your own life experience, and do you have an example in your life where you're like, yeah, I got told I wasn't technical, and I like kind of shrugged and went, what do you mean? Question. So, as a trapper, am I making assumptions about skill sets needed based upon me? Like, I've been in this job for 25 years. I know what a cybersecurity professional does and what they need to be able to do. Do I have any data to support that? No, but I have my gut. I, uh, questioning the ambiguous statements. So, you know, even during our interaction here, we had statements of like coding or scripting. If I walked into uh, my computer science class from two decades ago yeah. and asked people, you know, what coding meant, there was an assembler class and there was a C plus class. And I guarantee you those classes thought very differently onto what they meant by coding. So this is where we talk, and we'll talk about precision. Uh, questioning about my default values. You know, I found for myself when I did this introspection, I had the default value of pen testing, because you don't pen test, you're not in cybersecurity. Uh, I had the default value of coding, because if you can't do Python, and it wasn't just coding, it was Python. Can't do Python, you're not in cybersecurity. And I had nothing in there about risk, I had nothing in there about controls and, you know, going across domains. So, you know, questioning and also getting that outside perspective. So as you're questioning, going to your peers and going to your friends and having this discussion. You know your friends, you love them, they love you. And in that reflection, start, because again, we are nerds, start playing some experiments. Try a new ground rule for behavior, like as a manager, I cannot use the word technical in any of my reviews. As an IC, when I'm writing my own review, I cannot use that phrase. I cannot use the, the term uh, coding in my reviews. I need to reflect what I'm actually doing. I need to reflect the skill set that I'm utilizing. Uh, and the test, the other test and experiment that I implemented was uh, less instinct, more 
intentional. Meaning, taking that time, especially when working with others and working on my own side, to say, okay, what is the skill we're looking at, uh, and where are they at in it? On the awareness side, uh, we joke about the, the trap IOCs, uh, the indicators of caught or compromise or whatever we want to call them these days. But as a IC or a manager, take a look at your review feedback and looking for those ambiguous statements. Reading the statements as if you were someone completely outside the situation and going, if I read this statement of, hey, could work on X, could work on X technical skill set, is that clear enough to actually tell me what that person should do or tell me what I should be doing or my reports should be doing? Assignment trends, and this is something that I encourage anyone who has a people reporting to them. Start looking at and keeping track of the type of work that your people are being assigned. This is one of those sneaky ones because you know, it's a, we're all in the security architecture team, they're doing architecture work. Um, I found at one point, I definitely had one person who was doing way more control writing than they were doing systems architecture. And there was a, a default that had to be fixed at the belief that you know, this person didn't have a skill set there. Um, we talk about the lack of documented scope and you know, anytime you have a, a work task or a thing, an item, having that clear, what are we trying to do here? So you can actually go and talk about skill sets, which brings us into where I talk about precision. Like, as individuals in cybersecurity, and again, I don't care if you are a manager, or director, or a consultant, and I see precision is one of the biggest tools to root out bias and to fight the technical trap. Meaning when you have work that's assigned to you or you're signing out, the, if your work, has anyone had an assignment saying engineer a new system? I certainly have. And engineer a new data system. Great. The next task was to go break it up and actually figure out what that meant. But when it was reported out and talked about, all it was talked about was, oh, they engineered this data system, they engineered this system. The skill sets needed for the roles that are actually being enacted, and this is where we talk about the day-to-day -day work and being precise about what an individual is supposed to be doing. Um, I'm gonna say the, the scary word. I'm gonna say you know career ladders and role definitions. Uh, who here at work has ever had a career ladder? Yeah, building one or using, so, Career ladders have a both very positive connotation and a very negative connotation in our industry. Because some folks, when they're built, they end up being this checkbox to promotion, and in others, they be, end up being this you know, pathway or guide. So when you look at a role or an organization, and if there are no career path, and I'll use that as an alternative phrase, career paths that define skills required, not be more technical. And when we say skills required, we're down to, they need to be able to write Python. They need to be able to pen test Linux systems. They need to be able to you know, map controls from sys to stig. These are skills that we can measure against and not have ambiguous hand to sky statements about how someone is doing. As you look at those skill set breakdowns, one of the questions that I'll ask with each one is, if I'm measuring someone on a skill set, how do they train on that skill set? Because if they can't train on the skill set, either I've got a terrible skill set that just no one knows but the mystic master over in some faraway land, or I've got a, a skill set that I haven't properly defined. Um, and if I'm measuring or measuring folks on skill sets that they can't train on, how do they succeed? Curiosity can only get you so far. And the last one I want to call about a precision is um, ensuring that what we're measuring and looking at folks on and what we're measuring ourselves on, is it actually applicable to the core of the role that we're in 
or the role we're going to, or is it a one-off? For example, I had an engineer at one point get assessed on not knowing how to implement Juniper Firewall. Because the one weekend, one time, there was a need to fix something on a Juniper Firewall. Wasn't their job, wasn't their role, they didn't know the skill set. The feedback came to me, oh, this person's not technical. They couldn't fix the Juniper Firewall. Who here can go ahead and fix the Juniper Firewall? Wait, I thought you were all in cyber, there we go. All right, we've got one Juniper engineer. I thought you were in cybersecurity. Isn't that a cybersecurity skill? Sorry. I get a little fired up on this topic. I apologize. Um, but, so, oh dear. Oh, we have the wrong version now. Um, do you want to just do summary? Where's the summary slide? Uh, we have the usual fun of a, a slide issue. Um, one second, please. Oh, there it is. We like to hide slides from people, apparently. I'm sorry, that's my fault. Actually, it's a bit more of an engineering concept. <laughs> so, in summary, like, we all can't fill our roles. Let's be clear. We have way too much demand. But we don't need to sink our own ships, right? Like, so, we need to really let, you gotta stop letting bias stop you, right? So actually this applies, I would say, even more often when we're interviewing, right? So you're doing the debrief, you've had this great conversation, and somebody's like, oh, I mean, they were great, but they weren't technical. Like that, ha there's no way that hasn't happened to people in this room in a debrief. So like stop the person who says that and says, okay, well tell me what you mean. What, did, what skill did they not have that you think is essential to this role. Like, fight back when people say, oh, they're not technical. Because there's probably some sort of unconscious bias going on. And like, let's just call a spade a spade. Um, I think this impacts ICs and managers, 100%. And it's, it impacts everybody in our industry. Because either you will be told at some point you're not technical enough, or maybe you'll have the delightful experience that I had, which was I was working, uh, for my company on a booth. Someone walked up to me and they're like, you know, oh, what do you do? I'm a technical, at the time I was a technical program manager. And they're like, can I talk to someone technical? And I was like, wait, I think it's in my, oh, I'm like, okay, like I get it. Like you heard the word program manager and decided I wasn't technical, like literally it's in the title. But it happens, right? And I think it's how we respond um, to hearing stuff like that, and we don't let it stop us. And as I said, it impacts ICs, managers, everybody. We all have to be in this together. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of, there's both anecdotal data that we saw um, that indicates greater harm to underrepresented minorities and women. And like, we want to make this an inclusive industry. Like, we want to make sure there's everybody, because let's be clear. We don't want diversity for diversity's sake. We want it because the more people with different backgrounds that come in and join in a conversation, you get a better outcome. Like that has been proved again and again and again. So like let's embrace it for the awesome business enabler it is. Um, and to combat it, it takes focus. You, you gotta commit to this. It's not something I can just say like, oh, I'm just gonna like not fall trap. No, you have to commit. Um, I think reflection is the most powerful tool there is. I remember I was in business school and each week we had to reflect on stuff and I was like, this is an amazing tool. I wish I had this in my tool set earlier because it, it just allows you to learn in a different way. So reflect, like commit to becoming aware and get precise. Like if you're saying like, I need a technical person, really, what do you need? Like it's not sufficient anymore to say I need a technical person or I need an engineer. What exactly do you need? What skills do they have to have when they walk in the door versus what can you train them on? 
Like, what if you have a really exciting candidate that you believe you can train? Are you gonna let your bias of like, they don't know how to pen test stop you? I would hope not, but plenty of people do. So get precise, know what you want. And we would love uh, feedback. Like, if you like this, if you didn't like this, um, we're feedback at besidesfeedback.com. Yeah, we just did that in the speaker room. Yeah, we're like that. Um, and we'd love to open up for questions. I think we still have time. I'm not watching the timer. Um, or anything else, like any comments people want to say. Like, really did appreciate everybody participating. If you're participated out, I understand. But if you're not, we would love to hear any thoughts. Please. I can do it. I think that bias around the being technical and not technical can manifest in different ways. I have experience with it manifesting from the other side, when somebody considered to be too technical in order to be good enough with you know, soft skills and with people. And this was not based on any kind of actual experience with that person playing that role, but simply an assumption that you know, a good engineer is probably not also a good manager at the same time. Right? And I think that, I mean, if that is the case, then really it's just a stand-in for, you know, like the bias expresses itself in multiple different ways. I think that we shouldn't be just looking for specifically, you know, bias around the, the term you too technical, but about the biased approach to assessing people, you know, whatever terms are used to describe, kind of to pitch and call a person based on the preconceived notions. So, so true. You know, the statement uh, and kind of some re summarize of like bias impacts in all directions. And we talk about so, you know, getting precise on what's actually needed by a skill set and also oh, taking that fine. time to reflect and asking others to reflect on like, why is it that you say that this person who's an engineer doesn't have leadership skills? Well, they're an engineer. Okay, what does that mean? And you know, some of the times taking that Socratic questioning and just taking someone down that road, you get you get some amazing results when that person's eyes start to light up and go, crap. I'm just assuming that, oh, the engineer can't talk to humans. But what do you do what do you do when the person you're talking to doesn't know the specifics and just uses technical as an umbrella term because they don't know what they need? So I, I can speak from my experience. Depends situationally. I'd love to say that there's a, a catch-all golden answer, but I still am following down the, if you cannot specify beyond the word technical, then we are not in a position to assess the individual. If you cannot specify beyond the word engineer, we are not in a position to assess the individual, and we need to fix that. That's the problem now, and I'm gonna focus on that problem and once we fix that problem, we can come back to assessing the individual or the group of individuals. Okay, you were next. Yeah, you know, for myself, I mean, I've experienced this in job interviews and oftentimes coming from people other than the hiring manager who has some misconception about the role. In one case, I was interviewing for a security manager role and the director of development had something, you know, stuck in his head that I had to, you know, the role had to be a pin tester and I was not a pen tester, and in my opinion, that's not what a touring manager should be doing, you know, but he would just, you know, couldn't get over that and try to get the job. So, yeah. so those were the issues that go out Yeah, so the, um, what I heard was uh, around, like, having that situation where it's not, in a hiring situation where it's not even necessarily the hiring, and as a candidate, you won't know this. You won't know who it is on the back end that's like, well, that person can't bake bread, so obviously they're not a good systems engineer. Uh, loaf of bread is good, but. One thing I've found to be helpful is actually emphasizing my soft skills, especially when it comes to translating technical concepts into um, more approachable things. Yeah. Uh, so being able to communicate cross-functionally to less technical teams actually shows me to be a stronger technical person um, I think it's called uh, countersigning, um, but basically like being able to 
dumb things down without making the other people feel stupid has been really valuable in getting myself higher and higher as a technical person because I'm able to get more support from more parts of the company. And like CEOs aren't always the most technical critters. Sometimes they're a business critter. If you can tell them why you're doing a good job or why the engineer just kicked ass learning all of Terraform in a weekend, you become more valuable as a technical resource, as more like a technical consultant. And so that might be something that is more helpful, like to very on as well as this stuff. Very true. And and I love like taking, you know, we, we sometimes talk about engineering technical, like we're this isolated thing that we exist just for ourselves. Um, I, other than some nonprofits out there, I think most of us work for a company that, you know, makes profit and does something you know, and has other uh, facilities, and like you said, to be able to to communicate what what does it mean that the bumper on the car has been installed three seconds faster? Well, that means this in the business world, and I know we're having the conversations now about the CISO and BISO discussions, uh, which I think are going to be interesting in the next few years. But could part of the problem be the unrealistic expectations of? Um, people just starting out in the industry because they're new to it, but the cybersecurity industry is short of people, so they have slightly unrealistic salary expectations. So in bigger companies, to get those roles, it needs the title of engineer or whatever. So could that be part of the problem? I, I, I again, I can only speak for for the areas uh, for my experience, but definitely we, you know, we do have. Um, it's common practice, if you have an engineering title or a developer job class, your pay band is different than if you are a you know, technician. Um, and, <clears throat> sorry, um, and you know, the other part of your statement there around kind of folks starting out with, and I wanted to clarify, do you mean the folks, uh, the new people have unreal expectations on themselves or the companies have unreal expectations of new folks coming in? Uh, so the the discussion of like, I need to come into the industry as an engineer because that's a better pay band. So, but even at that point, as a hiring manager or as someone you know looking to fill out roles, my role title may be engineer, but my job description and my checklist for all my hires are skills. And if those skills aren't there, then we shouldn't hire that candidate. So I, something that I've experienced that I think is tangentially related to everything we're talking about is uh, a desire for candidates, uh, and I'm speaking as a candidate going into job interviews, a desire for candidates to have the experience which they cannot have without having the experience, if that makes yeah. sense. Like getting the initial experience is a huge barrier as someone who's coming into security without an IT background. Yeah. And that's, um, uh, it, it can be kind of brutal uh, in, in my experience. Yeah. I, what, what is your background? Uh, I was a farmer. Um, and then in 2019, I took a cybersecurity boot camp and then kind of went off on a tangent with it and found my tribe. That's awesome. Hell yeah. Okay. Or do you want to? I, either way. Uh, startups are so desperate for everyone. Please go find some startups. They have no idea what the hell they're doing. They're so precious and wonderful. Also, contracting. Um, contracting is great yep. because if you do a small project for someone and it doesn't work out, it doesn't matter. You can still put on your LinkedIn as contracting. Hey, oh, I keep my client list private. That means I can call your references. Um, uh, and if it does work out, then you do get a lot of really good experience and you can still dip out whenever it gets too crazy. So highly recommend startups and contracting and keep trying. It's crazy. And like adjacent stuff. I'm in QA. I come to security conferences because it scares the crap out of me. And because sometimes oh. I get to wedge some security bugs in as QA bugs. 
So there are sneaky ways in. What about, what about these entry-level positions that are advertising for uh, candidates with two or three years of experience yeah. and assist pay? That, so I, I want to reiterate, uh, re restate the, so essentially the question again about the, the, the hiring field today where we still have this terrible job description mantra of entry-level position, two to three years experience, CISSP required, which requires five years of experience before you can get the full CISSP. So the unfortunate side of that is that has to be corrected by the companies. Like as, a, as someone coming as a candidate, uh, you know, it, other than you could say, hey, this seems like we're on realistic expectations, but that, you know, as a candidate isn't really gonna help you in that situation. What I treat it as is those are red flags for me for companies I don't want to work for. Because they have not taken the time to reassess their job descriptions, to look for biases, to look for issues, and to try to make sure that they're recruiting in a diverse fashion and opening up the field. I don't want to work for a company like that. I want to work for a company that's gonna have a room looking like this with cool people, we're gonna have great times, and we're gonna break some shit. Okay, well, if there's nothing else, please, if you think of something later, please reach out. If this was helpful discussion, let us know. If you thought we, it wasn't, I mean, let us know too. That's all, I, I like all feedback. Yeah. Like, just be constructive with my, my only ask. Um, that's our, that's how to get a hold of us. Uh, and we, as we said, we're B-Side Seattle organizers, so you could probably also track us down that way. And thank you all for participating. We really appreciated it. And have a great rest of your day. That's all.